Morning, everyone. Uh, so I thought we would discuss the uh, the tangle that Rishi Sunak has got himself into now with this position on the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, it, it I, I just see a long term issue here. Like part of it is a long term problem for the Conservatives. So let's go through first of all what the situation is. Why Rishi Sunak's doing it? Um, he's again said that he would be prepared to leave the European Convention on Human Rights if the Strasbourg courts keep blocking flights to Rwanda. However, um, there's multiple problems to this. First of all, Strasbourg courts are not blocking flights to Rwanda. That is the UK Supreme Court, which sits in London and is, is the membership is 100% senior British judges. Um, they've also said, they made it clear, the Supreme Court in their ruling, that yes, the Rwanda plan is in breach of the European Convention on Human Rights. However, even if we were not signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights, it would still be blocked because it breaks other international laws and domestic laws. The fact that it can say, the Supreme Court can say, it's actually in breach. So even if we weren't a signature to any of these international laws, it's still a breach of domestic law. The Conservatives have not changed, and they have the power to do that. They have the power to change domestic law. They can't change international law. They can ask for it to be changed. There are some Conservatives who are saying particularly in light of this ruling against Switzerland. Oh, well, may, oh no, yeah, we don't leave the European Convention on Human Rights, but maybe we should reform it. It's like, okay, that's fine. The, you, you know, legislators should always look at legislation and decide if it needs modernising. Not a problem. But if you're talking about changing international law, you're going to have to get agreement with other international uh, governments, of course. So... Yeah, so the, the reasoning is completely spurious, but the mess he's got himself into now. he know, There are people in his party who want us to leave it. But they want us to leave it. They don't care about immigrants, right? They, they want us to leave it because they want to take away our human rights. And he knows that, and he's dangling the carrot to try and appease them, right? But it's not credible. Like Swella Bravan was saying, ah, oh, yeah, he wouldn't really do it, though. And people know that. People believe, because he doesn't come across as convincing. And then you have a report in the Times. Now, the report is very, um, it's not responsibly written. Because it's written from the point of view of as if Rishi Sunak could just choose to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. No, he can't. That's not for the government. Uh, the Parliament, in theory, could. But even then, Parliament would not without a public mandate. Because this is massive. And the but the article does at least say that the the vast majority of the cabinet are dead against this, even when it su suggests that there's members of the cabinet like Kemi Badenoch who are up for leaving it. Even they are not saying we should leave it; they're just leaving the door open. But it's only the most reckless even saying that. So there's no support in cabinet, and there's explicit opposition in cabinet. Like the majority of cabinet are saying, "Yeah, we can't leave this." And some of the reasons given are obviously things like the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement is built onto it. You know, Brexit sort of strained the Good Friday Agreement, but fixes were agreed. There are no fixes for this. The entire Good Friday Agreement is built on the, the assumption that the UK and Ireland are both signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights. So the Good Friday Agreement basically unravels without it. At which point... And if you think some of the, the people who are in favour of leaving the ECHR would say, well, we don't care about peace. They don't care about peace anywhere, quite frankly. They might care what the United States has to say about it. Because remember, because they, you know, because it's like a tribal partisan issue in this country, people imagine it's the same in America, but it's not. In America, there is 100% support across the mainstream political spectrum for the Irish peace process. So the Good Friday Agreement is sacrosanct to Republicans just as much as Democrats. In fact, people may not recall, when the orange one was still president, and you know Boris Johnson was prime minister and Brexit was... Trump's own aides 
the people he was appointing to represent his his interests were telling Boris Johnson not to play fast and loose with the Good Friday Agreement. There were Republicans, as there were senior Republicans as well as Democrats, writing open letters to the UK government saying, do not mess about with the Good Friday Agreement. So America, you know, would um, almost certainly take action, economic sanctions if we were to sort of dissolve that. Then there's other things as well. So the EU, of course, wouldn't be happy. Ireland very, wouldn't, very much wouldn't be happy. That is a member of the EU. And for anyone who sort of thinks, oh, but the rest of them will just, um, you know, they, they will prioritise trading relations with the, Britain rather than some gripe that Ireland has. Uh, I mean, Brexit has proved that to be incorrect. The EU has rallied around Ireland as the remaining member in Brexit matters. So withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights also allows the EU to dissolve the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Now, when you consider that Rishi Sunak, if you think about Rishi Sunak, since he's been prime minister, he's achieved basically one thing, right? The Windsor framework. That also allowed us to get back into Horizon. Um, but... The Windsor framework was his one achievement. He managed to agree a practical implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and managed to get the vast majority of his MPs to support it. So that's an achievement, right? Uh, admittedly, it's, it's only an achievement insofar as he's clearing up a mess that his own party made, but it is still an achievement. And why, was he, why did he put so much energy into doing that? And why did so many MPs support it? Because remember, there were influential Tories saying, no, we need to oppose this. They didn't like the Windsor framework. Boris Johnson, indeed. Boris Johnson was calling for people to vote it down, and yet they didn't. They ignored him. Why? Because it would have resulted in a trade war with the EU if we'd not agreed it. So the idea that Rishi Sunak and the vast majority of Tory MPs would support the Windsor framework in order to avoid a trade war over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol... The idea that these same people would countenance withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights, which would have way, way worse consequences, um, is frankly mad. Utterly mad. So he's not going to do it. Oh, uh, Ivan's just make a good point there. Rishi Sunak referring to the European Court of Human Rights as a foreign court is untrue. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The European Court of Human Rights is an international court of an international organisation. Yes, it's not foreign because we're part of it by definition. Um, foreign would mean and there is no such thing as a foreign court adjudicating over matters unless like um, but we, we have no foreign courts adjudicating matters over us like the European Court of Justice is now a foreign court technically but it wasn't at the time we were members um, the, the European Court of Human Rights is not a foreign court because you know we set well first of all we set it up but that doesn't matter as British judge on the panel so um, yeah we are, we are members of it um, just like the UN is not foreign because we're a member of it. But anyway, um, but th it occurs to me that this is creating a bit of a long term mess for the Conservatives as well. Now, we need to be careful. But first of all, the Conservatives. So imagine a scenario. So R Rishi Sunak can't actually leave. You can ask Parliament. I don't even think Tory MPs would vote it through the Commons. Consider... It was very squeaky bum time for him even getting the Rwanda safety bill through the Commons. That was not a certainty. That actually took a lot of political capital. The idea that he could even get the House of Commons to vote to leave the European Convention of Human Rights. Utterly ridiculous. Not a chance. And the, as for the House of Lords, forget it. Absolutely forget it. They'll just say, no, he ain't got a public mandate for this. Uh, it's really that simple. So... Then what happens? So what does he have the power to do? He does have the power to put it in the manifesto. But he needs to consider very carefully the consequence of that. And so do Tory MPs. Because there's, we know that the vast majority of Tory MPs wouldn't be in favour of this. They're not coming out publicly. Some members of the cabinet have. Most Tory MPs are keeping quiet for the sake of trying to keep their parties together. But they're not in favour of it. So th imagine the scenario... Let's say he puts it in the manifesto. Now, you could look at that as good and bad. 
you could look at it as good because the Tories are going to lose the election. Actually, putting that in the manifesto could really, could really cause them to lose more votes than they gain in key seats, in important seats. Because if you think about the sort of seats, we, we know the sort of voter that can be conned into thinking leaving, uh, dropping human rights is a good thing. They're not really in the Conservatives' target seats. They're key battlegrounds. It's in the ones that were battlegrounds in 2019, but they're not anymore. Like, you know, the Red Wall. We can imagine Red Wall seats. There'll be some voters there it appeals to. Conservatives aren't going to win those seats. Um, you know, the, the seats they're fighting for at the moment are what used to be their safe seats. They're not anymore. Used to be their... So you're talking about traditional Conservative areas. Those are the places they need to be like bolstering support in and this is the sort of thing that would would destroy that support or could destroy that support i don't know because there hasn't been enough detailed polling done on it but um let's say he puts it and i don't think he can put it in the manifesto which is why i think him even dangling the carrot is is self-defeating it doesn't help him it's like who's it for who's it for if he's dangling the carrot of oh we might leave the ECHR, if it's for the sort of if it's for you know let's be honest gammon voters, then it's like okay, but what you know he doesn't need them to support him now. He needs them to support him in the election. And I don't mean the local elections, I mean the general election. So by the time people are voting in the general election, the Tories will have published their manifesto. Does the manifesto say we should leave the European Co Convention on Human Rights or does it not? Because if it doesn't, then he hasn't won any support with this. He's wasting his time even talking about it and he wins no support. Because at the point at which people are going to go to the ballot box, they know that the Conservatives aren't going to do it because it's not in the manifesto. And if it is in the manifesto, so then imagine it is in the manifesto and somehow Tory MPs let him get away with it, right? So they put it in the manifesto. So then he gets roundly beaten. The Conservatives get roundly beaten. Now, you could say the idea has been definitively trounced, utterly defeated because you lost the election. But in reality, that's not how the Conservatives would see it. Because in reality, you can have very popular policies in a manifesto that gets... In 2019, Labour's manifesto had some popular promises in it, quite a few. The manifesto was comprehensively rejected by the electorate. But it doesn't mean that individual elements of it were bad and should have been dropped. So, um, oh, Simon Gigney, £2 super chat, thank you. Morning, Phil, have a coffee on me. I'm afraid it'll have to be Graham's coffee, but thank you. Um, but... Then think about the long term for the Conservative Party. As soon as it's in the manifesto, it's Conservative Party policy, right? Okay. So then they lose the election. Rishi Sunak steps down. Um, I did actually see a comment recently. It actually gone as far as publishing it in a mainstream media article. I can't remember which one now. Suggesting that Rishi Sunak should actually hang on for a bit. I don't think he's going to, and I don't think he can. But anyway... Um, it might be worth talking about some other time. So he steps down. So there's going to be a new leader, whoever it is. Who knows? That new leader, I think, is almost certain to be someone who either is already a member of the far right of the party or is having to appease them just like Rishi Sunak did, right? So imagine the scenario. Your party's official position is we should leave the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, sorry, European Convention on Human Rights. But they want us to not be subject to the European Court of Human Rights is their rationale. So the new leader comes in. It's still official party policy. Do they change it? Because they can't, at the moment, people like Kemi Badnock are going, oh, we should leave it on the table. We should leave it on the table. As soon as Rishi Sunak puts it in the manifesto, it's not, it's not, the table's neither here nor there. It's now policy. It's something the Conservatives want to do. So the next leader cannot just say something like it's on the table or it's off the table. They have to say whether it is still their policy or not. So they have to be able to say, yes, it's still my policy that we should leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Or no, it is not 
uh, party policy anymore. At which point she creates this huge fracture within the party or whoever wins does. It's, it's, um, it's a huge mess and this creates a mess for the Conservatives long term. And let us imagine, and it, it's a problem for us as well. You might think, well, this will like keep the Conservatives unelectable for a long time. But, you know, it's still worrying because there comes a time where the Conservatives don't have to be an awesome election winning machine to win an election. We saw that in 2010. The Conservative, although they pretended to be all sorts of things, they pretended to be more liberal, they pretended to be more green, you know, um, they still couldn't win a majority. Even then, you know, Labour, there was this huge recession <clears throat> related to the, the banking crisis. Um, Labour didn't run a good campaign. You know, Gordon Brown wasn't personally charismatic. Uh, the Conservatives have been out of power for 13 years, and yet they still couldn't win the majority. So it, it shows they don't have to become some awesome election winning machine. They just need to, they, they just need to wait until people are, you know, dissatisfied with Labour or taking things for granted or whatever, however you want to look at it. Or worse, worse still, that Labour actually do shit the bed in some way. And they could come back. And if it's still their policy, or even if it's not, let's say they have to drop it. Let's say they have to drop it and go, no, don't be ridiculous. The people who want it will still be there. And they'll have still, you know, they'll still be there in number. And as soon as they come back to power, it'll be back on the table again. They'll know they'll need a mandate. So there'll be like a referendum, just like with Brexit or something like that. But it'll be there. And when they come back to power, they'll make sure they win it. So it's a worry for us. But in the meantime, it's a huge worry for the Conservative Party because as soon as if Rishi Sunak puts that in the manifesto, the next leader will have to double down on it. I don't see any way that they will actually realistically say, no, it was a stupid policy, we're going to change it. Because you, you could, in theory, do that. You know, Rishi Sunak fails. The next leader can claim that absolutely anything that was in that failing manifesto is a failed policy. They can drop anything, but they won't. Uh, all the more, uh, uh, I'm saying there, all the more reason for Labour to aggressively push AV stroke PR, not AV. Uh, well, uh, you can have an AV sort of element to it, but uh, electoral reform, shall we say. Yes, Labour need to fully get behind electoral reform. Uh, you know, the way, I mean, the way I argue it from Labour's point of view, is whatever reforms they bring in, whatever they are, they're all gone if they stick to first past the post because the Conservatives will win again. It's really that simple. There are people, it's, it's maddening to me that there, are, there have ever been people who think, oh no, Labour can stay in power forever. Don't be ridiculous. The only countries where a single party remains in power forever uh, with a first past the post system are autocracies it's ones where it's really there is there's only a show of democracy doesn't actually exist you know ironically labor can stay in power in theory forever with proportional representation because i mean they wouldn't realistically they wouldn't because they'd get too big for their boots but realistically they're always going to be more appealing than the conservatives so they it should always be easier for them to find coalition parties than it is for the Conservatives as long as the numbers bear it out so Labour should there'll also be less pressure on Labour to split than the Conservatives if we had proportional representation you know there is a possibility that both would split but there's there's more pressure on the Conservatives to split into a sort of traditional Conservative Party and far-right Reform UK lunatic style party whereas with Labour there isn't, um, you know, obviously the, the, the tanky crowd would want to split, but there's already a party for them anyway. They'd probably just join it. Um, there isn't a natural split for Labour because the Green Party already occupies ground that you might imagine a split would go to. So there'd be no real need for a split. You just may get the Labour Party getting a bit smaller. Uh, why did I leave the rat on the screen from yesterday's morning, Bruce? Sorry. I, I, it's easier to recycle images, you see. Um, 
<laughs> uh, pretty sure Richie hasn't got a Scooby apart from the India trade deal. Uh, I mean, the India trade deal, it's still, I'd be surprised if you got an agreement on that. Because again, I don't, given that what India want is those extensions to the visa, the student visa. So they basically want, what India wants is, right, okay, V. you know, we already have student visas. So, you know, Indian citizens can study in the UK and that's all fine. And then at the end of your studies, you know, you can apply for a work visa. Anyone can apply for a work visa or you go back home because your student visa is going to expire, right? So what India want is an automatic extension, I believe of up to two years, that allows Indian students to remain in the country and working and everything else, like, you know, a visa to allow them to do anything they like, uh, obviously legally, um, for two years after their studies end. Now, that's going to go down very badly with the Conservatives at the moment who are having to beat a very strong anti-immigration thing. I mean, we've got a situation at the moment can you imagine Rishi Sunak saying, oh, yeah, we should make it really unattractive for people to come here and do care work uh, as well as, you know, staff our NHS. But, oh, yeah, we should totally give um, any Indian student that wants it a two year free visa to do what they like in this country. I, I can't see him selling that to his MPs, if I'm honest. I can't see him. And that'll be where the sticking point is. Because if the Conservatives were happy with that, if his own MPs would be happy with that, he'd have already agreed the deal. He'd have 100% agreed the deal. So I just struggle to see how he's going to get anything through. But anyway. Say hi, Phil. Sunak has already jumped on the Farage boat of proposing to leave the ECHR as a, a vote catcher. It's probably one of the few referendum topics that Farage could muster some interest from. Well, the thing is, like, like I said, though, it, it's not a vote catcher. It doesn't work. Like if he's trying it just for the local elections, like, okay, but... But for the general election, it doesn't work. Because for the it doesn't matter what the polls say right now. I mean, it does sort of. Because the polls are so bad, it's putting pressure on him. It means he could... You know, he's not guaranteed to be able to lead the party into the election if he wants the election in autumn. But, I mean, he probably will be able to. I don't think more than half of Tory MPs are going to try and oust him, which is what would be needed. Um, you know, the confidence vote would be unwelcome, but if he just puts his head down, he could even get through that. But in the general election itself, like I said, at the, even if people are doing postal voting, they vote two weeks before the polling date, the manifesto's still been published for several weeks. I mean, the manifestos will be published fairly quickly when the election is called i mean the tory one might be written on the back of a cigarette packet because apparently they don't have one ready to go if we if we're to believe reports i'm not sure i do believe that because that seems a bit mad to me but if the tories don't even have a framework of a manifesto ready to go right now that seems insane so when they do come up with one it, it sounds like it i mean when you consider i keep saying Labour have had a working manifesto ready to go for two years now. As soon as it became clear that Boris Johnson was in real trouble, they thought, because if Boris Johnson hadn't gone, let's say he refused to acknowledge the tap on the shoulder, you know, let's say the 1922 committee couldn't, because he was immune to a confidence vote, because he'd had a confidence vote and won it. So the only way to get Boris Johnson to step down was either to change the party rules or persuade him to voluntarily step down, which is what happened. But let's say they hadn't done that. And let's say that it created a huge... And remember, Boris Johnson had the power, legislative power, to call an election. So Labour were working on the basis that, let's say Boris Johnson refused to step down. And let's say that rather than be ousted, he would call a general election. So they had a manifesto ready to go, just in case. And they've had it ready to go ever since. It's changed since then. But every time they change it, it takes about three or four months. There's a process that it goes through for them to sort. Like they had that process uh, just before spring where Labour in the first few months of, the, of this year said, right, we're going to now finalise our manifesto. 
ready for a possible May 2nd general election. Um, and that process took several months. So the idea, if the Conservatives don't even have a manifesto now, that in any form at all, the idea that they can actually have a detailed thought through manifesto in time, it seems a bit weird. But anyway, rambling on. The, the point is, it's, you know, it's at the point at which people are voting, the manifesto's out. Does the manifesto say we should leave the European Co Convention on Human Rights? Does it or not? Because if it doesn't, then whatever votes he thinks he's catching, he can't, I mean, he can't any, I don't think he'd catch those votes anyway, even if he put it in the manifesto. But he certainly can't catch them by not putting it in the manifesto. Because right now, everyone who's, who is advocating for leaving says Rishi Sunak won't do it. He won't do it. He ain't got the balls. He ain't got the spine. He won't do it. So if it's not in the manifesto, they're right, aren't they? And, and I don't think it can be in the manifesto. But if it is in the manifesto, you know, what cost does that come at for the Conservatives? What cost for them? And will the Tory MPs, the so-called moderate Tory MPs, who have been silent for best part of a decade now, they didn't, they didn't stop David Cameron putting the referendum in the manifesto for 2015. Uh, they didn't stop him conducting the referendum in a ridiculous way. You know, it was basically a blank check. There was no, it was, it was a really bad referendum as well as a bad referendum campaign. But never mind the campaign. That's neither here nor there. The, the referendum itself, the way it was structured was very bad. They allowed that. They allowed as soon as the result came in, that we should leave the EU for all of a sudden it to become party policy. Oh, yeah, we should leave the single market and customs union as well. It's like, hang on a minute. Whoa, 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 you didn't say that. No, they allowed that to happen. They didn't say anything about that. They allowed us to actually leave with a hard Brexit. You know, they've 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 now allowed the Rwanda plan, which has only helped reform UK. They have stood back and basically in the interest of, oh, well, we just need to. If we just give them this extra little thing, then they'll then it'll all be fine. We need to keep the party united. And, and you know, at what point do they stop? Is there a do they have any red lines? Do they have any red lines at all? But anyway, uh, it's not like they've been hesitant pushing non manifesto policy right now. Well, um, but, the, the, but what I mean is at the point which the election comes, there has to be a manifesto. It has to be there. So dang, this, this idea of dangling the carrot, oh, it's on the table, we might consider it. It doesn't work for the general election because you have to say what your policies are. And yeah, we know they're dishonest about them, but they have to actually say what they are. It, it doesn't make any sense, this strategy. All it's doing is actually creating fractures in the party. It's creating fractures. What he should say is, no, of course we're not leaving. It underpins so much of what we've already built up. Don't be ridiculous. He, I mean, if they want to take the line, like apparently some uh, senior members of the government are taking the line. Well, you know, the European Convention on Human Rights is terribly important. We don't like this latest ruling against Switzerland. So maybe there's a case for reform in it. OK, not a problem. So you have a policy to say, we should engage with other members of the um, Council of Europe to decide whether we should modernise, you know, or, or we need to reform the European Convention on Human Rights for the modern age. Absolutely. Put that in your manifesto. No problem. No problem at all. But the idea of saying, you know, we should take our ball and go home over something like this. An utter mess. It's not winning votes. It's not helping Rishi Sunak sustain himself or sustain his leadership i mean there comes a point where i mean we're focusing on voters here i don't think this is for voters i don't think he can be that sh i know he's politically inept but he's also not a stupid man i don't think this i don't think him dangling the carrot is for voters because he mo even if he has no idea about politics which is quite evident there must be some strategists who are advising him who do because i know there are Isaac Leverdew, at the very least, yeah, he's onto a loser. He's not having a good track record at the moment, but he's not. He he does know how to run a campaign, right? He will be telling Rishi Sunak that this is not a vote winner. I think 
this dangling the carrot. It's not for gammon voters because that doesn't make sense. I think it's just for the far right in his own party. It's a it's basically a way of saying to them, I might put it in the manifesto. I might put it in the manifesto. You stick with me. I'm seriously considering it. In fact, he's actually trying to give them the impression that he will put it in the manifesto. Because remember what he says. Oh, if the Strasbourg courts keep blocking the Rwanda plan, I'm going to put it in the manifesto. Or, well, he said, I will withdraw. But he knows the only way to withdraw is put it in the manifesto. So I think it's for them. I think it's for M I don't think this is for voters. It doesn't make any sense for it to be voters. I think it's for some Tory MPs. So they don't put their letters in. I think he's basically saying to them, privately he's probably saying this explicitly to them we need to let this run we need to let um, my plan to get flights off the ground run but at the end of the day if it still ends up being blocked by the courts i'll absolutely take this action i think that's what he's saying what's next leave the un well this is the thing like the the supreme court made it clear it wasn't just about the european convention on human rights even if we were not signed up to it it would still be illegal so, yeah, and one of the things they cited was the Refugee Convention, the UN, a UN convention, which we are signed up to. So, yeah, are we going to are we going to leave the UN? Are we going to leave our permanent seat on the Security Council? No, of course we're not. No Tory would would advocate that. You know, we're not. As I say, we haven't even changed domestic law and they did want to. Dominic Raab wanted to. The domestic law being the Human Rights Act. Right. The Conservatives did plan on getting rid of that, but they haven't. They haven't done that. And, and so even if we left the European Convention on Human Rights, if you leave the Human Rights Act alone, because what the Human Rights Act did was to enshrine the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law. So it doesn't, you know, it, it's no major need for it. Um, but nonetheless, it is domestic law and the Conservatives haven't touched it. But anyway, there we go. That's my little ramble about that. Uh, thanks for coming on, everyone. We're sort of running out of time. Um, have a very good day, as always. Graham should be back on tomorrow. He's been eating candy floss, you know, while we've been working. Uh, but have a great day. Don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, I'll see you later.